Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I was joking with my friends on Facebook this week that LPS had planned really well because here it is, spring break and time change Sunday all at the same time. And LPS must have said, we don't want those cranky kids (laughs) who have not slept enough and the teachers don't want to be there either. So let's have spring break this week, right? (laughs) Yes. So, welcome to worship this morning. There are several announcements in our bulletin to draw our attention to. Um, Please look through them on your own, but um, the ones that I'd like to note are the ones that have changed. I, my family had a dear, dear, dear friend pass away on um, Thursday, Thursday early morning, anyway, um, or late night, and um, kind of like a surrogate parent to uh, my brother and I. And they live in Bismarck, North Dakota, so I'm planning on going back for the funeral, um, and it's on Thursday at 11.30, so I'm gonna, we're going to take off after um, the stay-at-home mission trip activity at Tabitha, and then um, be back um, by Sunday. So, um, so the Carol Joy Halling Bible Camp activity They're talking, maybe it would rain anyways, so we're going to not do that one. This I'm going to call and cancel at camp. So on the 14th, don't plan on coming for that stay-at-home mission trip activity. We're going to cancel that. And um, thank you to Bruce and Doug and Pastor Rob and I think Keith, who are planning on leading worship on Wednesday for us. Um, And let's see. Yes, the rest of the bulletin is filled with all things that are coming up for Easter, so please take time to to pay attention to that. A note on the Easter Vigil Service. First Lutheran is holding a community-wide Easter Vigil Service this year at 7 o'clock on Saturday. And um, if you've never participated in an Easter Vigil Service, they're really... They're really beautiful in every way. They, they tell one story after another from scripture that all talk about how God is with us in the midst of death, bringing new life. And if you remember the um, posters that we had hanging around our sanctuary last year, um, those are half of the Easter vigil stories. So it's sort of, it's this great big huge pageant from the Old Testament to the New Testament that happens filled with music. And so, 7 o'clock on Saturday, if you have time, consider going to First Lutheran and participating in that. Um, Easter egg hunt is coming up, and we're looking for donations of candy for that. And then, last note is, if you'd like to give a lily in memory or honor of a loved one for the Easter service, um, fill out the orange Um, paper that was in your bulletins this morning and return it to the church office by the 21st. Um, Other announcements today? In our prayers today, um, please keep Marty's family in your prayers, but even more, um, I got a phone call early this morning from Jack Farrell, and his son was, um, was run over last night and passed away. And so keep Jack and Dee and their daughter Allison in your prayers, um, especially this week. Um, no information as to when the funeral will be as of yet, but um, hold them in your hearts. Others today in our prayers? Okay. We begin our worship then with a temple talk from Morning Hope which is our cause of the month this month. Uh, Good morning. Um, I did this at 8.15, and I felt like I had to introduce myself because it's been so long since I was at the early service. So um, I'll just do that again. I know most everybody here, but um, my name's Diane Brustel, Steve and I. Um, have been a part of Morning Hope now for almost 20 years. Um, We serve on the board of directors and we also um, volunteer for them as grief facilitators and we have fun doing camp and all sorts of other things with them. But um, 
we first got involved with Morning Hope after um, Josh died. Um, we took Jess, our daughter, through a family group there. And that kind of got us hooked, and we're still still there today. So, um, But they have grief support groups for all ages. They, their main core one is their 10-week group, which is focused on children and their caregivers. We do adult groups, adults only. We also have a young adult group for those um, like late teens through the 20s. We have groups for families that are affected by suicide. We do individual counseling. Um, like I mentioned, we also have two camps, uh, weekend camps. Uh, we have a family camp coming up here in April, and then in September we always go to Carol Joy and have a, the kids have a camp. Um, and all of these services that Morning Hope offers are at no cost. So we totally rely on donations and grants that we apply for. So, um, and we're gonna watch a little video here, use our new technology. It was originally a video done for um, the United Way campaign that, that we're part of, but it has very good information. So, Tiff? Hi, I'm Rachel McConnell, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Morning Hope Grief Center where I serve as Community Engagement Director. And I'm proud to share with you about Morning Hope's work and how grateful we are to be a United Way partner agency. Through grief support groups, individual counseling, community education, and other resources, Morning Hope companions people before and after a death loss. Our organization was founded in 1994 to fulfill the need for broader community support for grieving families in Nebraska. In our initial years, Morning Hope focused on serving children and their caregivers in various spaces across Lincoln. Fast forward almost 30 years, and now we're in our permanent home in the West A neighborhood. Our programming has grown exponentially to include teen and young adult groups, adult grief support, school-based groups, and educational events, in addition to our 10-week family grief support sessions. In 2022, Morning Hope served 1,564 unique individuals, which is a 30% increase over the previous year. And beyond our walls, we also reached over 4,000 additional individuals through community grief presentations. This need for a safe and understanding environment in which to discover hope and healing will never go away. No matter who you are, how old you are, or what neighborhood you're from, you will experience grief in your lifetime. It's most important to note that Morning Hope services are offered to participants at absolutely no cost, reinforcing our desire to be accessible and inclusive to everyone in our community. And that is why the United Way Community Impact Dollars makes such a difference to Morning Hope. We receive no government funding or insurance reimbursement for our programs. It is solely through the financial support, generosity, of businesses and individuals like you that we keep showing up, keep being there for our community. So thank you for your time. Every gift truly matters and helps organizations like Morning Hope continue to meet the needs of our community and to spread our vision that no one has to grieve alone. Thank you. Thank you. Just to let you know, there are a few handouts out on the table in the Narthex if you want to look them over. Thank you.
As we gather for worship, we reflect on life, and we begin by confessing our sins, laying, in that, laying them at the cross of Christ, and looking to Christ for forgiveness and grace. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Gracious God, we are guilty of often looking back and believing the things were once better than they are now. We often see only the problems before us and we overlook the grace and love around us. We see scarcity and we turn in on ourselves. Lord, turn our eyes and our hearts to the cross. Fill us with the hope that even in there, in the most painful and alone places imaginable, you are with us, defeating death itself. Turn our hearts, Lord, that we might look up and walk with you, sharing in the abundant love you provide. Amen. Beloved of God, Christ died and rose for you. You are forgiven. Walk and live in Christ. Amen. God, rich in mercy, 
By the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light, that all our deeds may reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is taken from Numbers chapter 21. Though God provides food and water for the Israelites in the wilderness, they whine and grumble. They forget about the salvation they experienced in Exodus. God punishes them for their sin, but when they repent, God also provides a means of healing, a bronze serpent lifted up on a pole. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 2. 
While we were dead in our sinfulness, God acted to make us alive as a gift of grace in Christ Jesus. We are saved not by what we do, but by grace through faith. Thus, our good works are really a reflection of God's grace at work in our lives. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were, by nature, children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast, for we are what has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Please rise as you're able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that they may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. It's time I invite our congregation to be seated and our children to come forward for our children's message this morning. show of hands, how many of you have played hide and seek before? How many of you love that game? Sometimes our church youth group plays hide and seek, but they do it different. They play a game called sardines, and it's opposite hide and seek. One person hides, everybody else goes look for them, and when they find them, they hide with the person who's hiding until everybody's hiding. And the way we play that game is we turn off the lights. Why would turning off the lights make sardines so much better? Why do you think? You think it's easier or harder to hide when it's dark? Huh? Harder to hide when it's dark or easier? 
One time, one time, somebody hid right behind that balcony wall in plain sight. They just sat down on the edge of the balcony wall. We all went up to the balcony. We all looked around. We did not see them because it was dark. They were just sitting there, shh, quiet. We left. We went up and looked at the balcony again. We looked there many times, never saw them, till one person saw them. And once there got to be a few people, then OK. We could all see them. Now, see, now I told you the great hiding spot. If you ever come, when you get older and you play sardines because you're in the youth group, if you hide there, I'm going to know where to look for you. Just stay in. But anyway, that's the thing. Because it was dark, you could hide in plain sight. If the lights had been on and you would have hid there, I'd have found you right away. Our lesson today says the people love darkness rather than light. Jesus is the light of the world, but the people liked the darkness more. And I think the reason for that is because sometimes we like to hide. Do you ever hide things from your parents or from your teachers or from other people because you don't want them to know? The thing about hiding stuff is it usually, in the end, hurts us. But we have a God who's light and who invites us to trust him and to trust that even if we have bad things that we've done to tell him, that he'll love us and we don't have to hide those things from him. Because in the end, even when we hide in really great places, sooner or later we get found. That's the truth. And usually, it's so much worse when we get found later on. It's always better to tell the truth. And God says, it's OK. You can tell me the truth. Because no matter what, even if the truth isn't particularly what God wants to hear, God promises to love you through it. And there's a gift of letting it go and stopping the hiding process. Wouldn't it be a bummer to play sardines and never be found? Yeah. God loves you so much that he comes to find you, and he says, you can be honest. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your amazing love. Lord God, when we are hiding, come look for us. And Lord, help us to never hide from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming. See now, I hide my candy, and you all know where I hide it. How does that work? It's not dark in here. <laughs> That's it, isn't it? <laughs> if I turn out the lights, you won't know where to look anymore, will you? <laughs> no. Still You'll still know where to look. <laughs> All right. Take one. Head out. Hustle. Okay. You have enough candy. You already raided my stash. Please pray with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. How do you feel about confession and forgiveness? Is it your favorite part of worship every Sunday morning? You just can't wait to come and do that? 
Do you sometimes just rattle through it without paying much attention? Do you sometimes wish that it could be a bit longer and that there could be more silence so that you'd actually have time to discuss personal stuff with God? Do you ever take time after you've gone home or maybe during the week to just have private confession? I'm asking not as a, like, let's take account thing. I'm asking because, well, I've done all of these things before. Sometimes I just rattle through. Sometimes there's a lot on my mind and I'm really annoyed that we're already to the sermon before I'm done with confession, right? But I got to thinking about confession and forgiveness this week and how maybe it doesn't hit like the very top thing on our agenda. And yet, at the same time, it's an amazing, amazing gift. Because what an amazing treasure to know that we have a Lord who loves us so very, very much that he invites us to be completely open and honest with him about everything, with the Lord about every last thing, and that he loves us so much that we can trust that when we are honest and we tell God things that we know God is probably not overly great about hearing, that we can trust that not only will God not give up on us, he'll be there to work with us through all the broken. Because confession and forgiveness is sometimes, I'm really sorry for this, Lord. And I have a terrible truth to tell because I have really screwed some things up. And sometimes I think confession and forgiveness is also, Lord, life is a mess and I'm not exactly sure how I got here but it is way heavier than I can carry and I don't think I can see my way through this and I really, really, really need your help. And I'm not sure why I should be sorry, but man, it's heavy right now. I think confession and forgiveness is that too. I've tried every last thing, Lord, and now I really could use your help, right? We could start there. But confession and forgiveness is that place where our heart is really vulnerable. And the good news is God loves us so much that God can be trusted to hold on to our hearts. I couldn't help but think about that blessing of confession and forgiveness when I looked at the text for this week. John 3.16 from our gospel is the gospel in a nutshell. It's the thing that is posted on baseball signs, right, behind home plate. John 3.16, hoping that people will actually go and look up the verse. It's the verse that when I was in vacation Bible school and Sunday school, and my teachers weren't overly big on the memorization project, this was the verse that they really thought that all of us kids should know by heart. And they made sure that we knew it by heart because they teach it to us in a song. Way back in vacation Bible school days, we learned this verse almost verbatim in a song. This is the version I learned. Why don't you sing it? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary's tree. To set me free Someday He's coming back What glory That will be Wonderful His love To me Just like that It's a little ditty But all these years later Vacation Bible School was a really long time ago for me All these years later that song can play through my head because I know it that deeply. And of course, this is the ditty version, you know, the little ditty of the song. But the verse says things just a little different. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that, who, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's a gospel in the nutshell because there is power in this verse. There's power 
that I think is both individual for all of us and also universal for the whole world. Back in my vacation, back in my Bible camp days, I had a counselor who said, in order to really grasp this verse, make it personal. Take out the word world, replace it with your name, and know that this verse is meant for you. I think we should try that today, too. So take out the word world, put in your name. For God so loved that he gave his only son, that whoever one who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What does it sound like to hear that the promise is specifically for you? God gave his son for you to walk with you through every single day of this journey, to be there in the absolute brokenness, to die on the cross, so that when everything is falling apart, you will know that the Lord is there with you in the apartness, and that Christ is forgiving you and walking with you through it. That God gave his son for you, and that Christ went to death and died for you, so that even when you face death, you are not alone. Nobody else can walk with you all the way through that, but God will. And death won't be the end of the story. God gave his son for you, and Christ walked from the tomb, and rose again, and so Christ lives for you, and one day will give you eternal life. God did all of this for you personally. But the verse doesn't insert your name. The verse says, the world. And that's important too, and powerful. God doesn't just love each of us as individuals. He does. Every single one of us as an individual and the entire world, all of creation. This promise is not even just for people. It's for God's entire created world. God loves this world so very much that he sent his son to die and restore the entire world. So much hope, because it doesn't take much to see the brokenness in the world around us. And it is good, good news to know that God is in the midst of restoring it all. This promise is for everyone. But before and after this promising verse, I feel like there's a little bit of struggle. Verse 14 talks about the poisonous, flying, biting snakes from the book of Numbers. Now the NRSV makes the translation just very, very nice. It just talks about poisonous snakes that bite people and then they die. So in my mind, I go to rattlesnakes because when I go to the Omaha Zoo and I see Rattlesnake can Canyon, it completely unglues me. So good enough. But that's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about here in the Hebrew is a really weird kind of snake that is kind of the same Hebrew root word that's used for seraphim, which is kind of like a flying angel with gazillions of wings, and scary, right? This is a scary, flying, fire-breathing snake that bites people. Freaky in every way. And God sent these terrible creatures because God's people were complaining about the way that God was taking care of them. Slavery in Egypt was so much better, they complained. Why did you bring us out to this wilderness to die, where there is no food and there is no water, and we detest this miserable food? I thought there was no food and no water. Every time I read this passage, I can hear my dad's ranting words at me. Carla, if you want something to complain about, I will give you something to complain about. Some of you are nodding. You had the same father I did, huh? The people had food. They had been set free 
At every turn, God had provided for them and took care of them, and yet still, they had their complaints. And now, their complaints weren't just at Moses and Aaron, they were aimed at God himself. So God sent these terrible, fiery, bitey serpents to bite them, and many died. And then they indeed did have something to complain about. But then God gave them a cure. And the cure was to put that serpent up on a stake and to look at the sin. The cure was to look where the sin had led them and, to, and in honestly looking at the sin to be healed. Most of the time in our church, the crosses that we have are empty because we remember that the cross is part of the story, not the entire story. Christ died for our sins. Christ also rose. So not the entire story, but a really, really important part of it. But what would happen if more of our crosses actually contained Christ on them, like they do in other churches? I think it would help us envision the way that Jesus cures us. They would make us look honest, be honest about where we're at. And as we looked at that cross and saw Christ, we'd have to look at death and acknowledge our sins and acknowledge how those sins are literally killing us bit by bit and then acknowledge that we cannot survive without the Lord. The text for today begins by inviting us to be honest about our sins and our brokenness and to look to the cross and be healed by the Lord who died for our sins and is present with us in the brokenness. And just when we think that all is well and that Christ has loved us through it, then we come to the end of this text for the week. And there we read about the darkness. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they did not believe in the, holy, in the one and only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that they may be seen clearly that their deeds have been done in God. I've been asking myself all week, do we really love darkness? Do we choose darkness? The more I thought about it, the more I considered that the gift of darkness is that it hides things. A few months ago, I took the kids to the amazing pizza ranch, pizza machine, not pizza ranch, pizza machine, the amazing pizza machine in Omaha. We went there for fall break. It was like a, you know, fun thing. Anyways, when you go there, if you've ever gone there, it is all things kids. That is the restaurant's claim to fame. They will sell you a buffet package where you can eat all things kids. Pizza, pasta, salad bar for adults that's less than wonderful because it's all things kids. And soup. And, you know. And then you go to the drink counter where they'll serve you slushies and pop and ice cream. All things kids. It's amazing. Sort of. Right? Anyways, you buy the all-you-can-eat package of the yummy kids' food. And then when you're done, there's the all things arcade. And so you go and you play arcades and there's rides and there's bowling and there's fun. And you can buy the package that is play all, the time, play all as long as you can for one cost. That's my deal. Absolutely. So we bought the all you can play and all you can eat package and we were playing and I'm all about using every last bit of the money and that's how we ended up at the prize counter at Pizza Machine as they were turning on the lights and telling everybody to go home. Because you know, the whole place is rather darkish. 
That's what makes the arcade game's lights flicker better, right? So they're turning on the lights and they're vacuuming and they're doing all the things, go home, Carla, routine. And I look around and I'm like, ooh, this restaurant is a lot better in the dark. <laughs> That's what I thought. Because suddenly the carpet that was all things kids looked like it was all things kids. And the walls that the place that was all things kids looked like they'd been played on by kids forever. And I was like, oh, that's sticky. I can see it. Huh. Yeah. Because sometimes darkness truly does hide the things that we'd rather not have the world see. So do we love darkness? Well, sometimes darkness is just plain scary. But other times, it hides the stuff that we'd rather not show the world. So I wonder, do we? Yes, sometimes we do. But here's the good news. When the Lord of heaven and earth sent his son to us, he died on the cross in the broad daylight. It was the middle of the day when Christ hung there for us so that all the world could see that our Lord loves us so much that he dies for us in the middle of all that we'd like to hide and is present with us. There is nothing that we need to hide from the Lord because the Lord is with us there. We can bring all of our brokenness flat out to the light with God. That's where Christ is with us. And then a few days later, when darkness seems to have taken over everything, the Lord rolls back the stone. And the new day dawns, and there is light and there's hope. At times, I think we all choose darkness. But the good news is the light of Christ is present, and it shines even in those dark places, and it gives us hope and new beginning. For God so loved you that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The gospel in a nutshell. And it is for you and for all the world. Amen. Thanks be to God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that all who believe in him may not perish but have eternal life. Gather our hearts, Lord, as we trust in your eternal love and turn to you in prayer. Lord, like the Israelites in the wilderness, we too have known your love and experienced your care and provision. You invite us to extend that love to the world around us, to care for others as deeply as we care for ourselves. And so we bring the needs of our world before you now. We pray for the many who do not have enough, enough to eat or shelter to keep warm, enough employment or money to pay their bills, enough medicine or medical care. Hear our prayers as we lift up all who are sick struggling and weighing heavy on our hearts. We also pray for those who have more than enough, but who still struggle to find meaning and purpose in life, who indulge in dangerous or self-serving activities to dull their pain or loneliness. Here are prayers for those who hide their struggles just below the surface. God, your grace reaches out to all of us. We pray for the kingdoms of the world. We pray for wisdom for those called to lead. We pray for good judgment, prayerful hearts, steady spirits, and especially we pray for the places of this country and world where life is unstable and volatile. We pray for peace and healing. You call us to live as citizens of heaven, working together with one heart and mind. Strengthen us to live in a manner worthy of the good news we have received, offering our lives in service of your kingdom, where the last are first and the first are last. And there is enough grace for all. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of death, you restore my soul and you give me rest. All the memories of your faithfulness. You restore my soul and you give me rest. You restore my soul and you be with you all. Please turn to your neighbors and share that peace today.
Please rise as you're able and let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with a hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Christ invites us to this table and feeds us with his presence, with his forgiveness, grace, and love. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The meal is ready, and all are welcome at this table. Please come forward as the ushers give instruction today. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bring to you and keep you forever in his grace and love.
Please rise as you're able and receive this blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you forever in his grace and love. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As the grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. We are sent out to love and serve the Lord. We go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.